about um, dealing with loss, um, dealing with losing someone. Um, I will try not to pound this too much, kind of uh, have it be a shorter lesson. Um, obviously, since uh, d losing someone is always a little bit hard, and I don't want to um, exasperate your guys' emotions for no reason. So how do you help someone who lost someone close? Have you ever had a friend, maybe, or, or an acquaintance who, who lost someone who was close to them, and what did you do to help them? Or what do you think you could do to help them? Either or. Well, my mom lost her husband a little over a year ago. She still, she still grieves a lot, and it's very hard for her still. I don't do it so much now, but I, since I don't live close to her, you know, I would call her twice a week, just make her feel like she was not all alone since he's been gone, and um, try to encourage her in the Lord, um, encourage her to, you know, try to get involved with church and, you know, try and get involved and, and surround herself with people so that she didn't isolate herself, and you know, just reminded her that, you know, my stepdad, he was old and, and he had cancer and he was just suffering a lot and just reminding her that, you know, he's he's not suffering anymore and, 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 the, and what she had to go through in caring for him and working a full-time job, you know, that was very, very stressful for my mom. And so I told her, you know, that... God took Billy and and he relieved his pain and relieved her stress and you know we just have to be thankful to God for the time that we had with him and be thankful for God's mercy that he took him so I just continue to encourage her in the Lord and and to be as close as possible even though I was not close in distance you know um, just so that she didn't feel alone and, and just made sure she didn't isolate herself Good. Anybody else? <coughs> Did anybody else have anything to say? No? Okay. So um, a lot of times when um, we know someone who's going through the thing, it can be a little bit awkward for us. You know what I mean? You don't really know how to, how to respond. Um, do you think it changes anything if it's you who lost the person? Do you think that, do you think that changes anything? Is there, is there something specific that um, you think would help you at that time? I think it's just having someone... I don't want to say they're like all the time, mm -hmm. but you have somebody close by checking on you, I would say, pretty much every day. Okay. Just to make sure you're not getting especially depressed. So like someone who's available. Right. Just because you're so used to being there with that person so much. I mean, I'm saying like a spouse or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay, good. Anybody else? I know. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I know with me, it's... Whenever I do lose someone, it's just I kind of isolate because that way it's not being brought up mm -hmm. constantly, and it, I seem to grieve better. You know, if I'm just kind of off on my own, but I do like, you know, somebody be there to listen mm -hmm. for when I do talk. And I think that's really important too, is having somebody there that's willing to listen, that won't really, I guess, kind of keep reminding you. Yeah. Mm. Good. Good. Anybody else? I was just gonna say, um, you know, re reaching out to somebody who can kind of relate with what you're going through, and maybe, you know, just finding out how they how they handle it. Um, once again, I know when my stepdad died, uh, my mom had a friend who had just lost her son. He was shot to death. 
in an altercation at a bar. He was only like 20 years old. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and so she had just, you know, been grieving the loss of her son. Mm -hmm. And then my and my mom went to her son's funeral and everything, and that was a really hard thing. Um, for my mom too, they were really close. My uh, my sister used to babysit him. His name was William, and and his sister. And so we spent summers with them. Um, and so it really helped my mom a lot to have her because she was dealing with the loss and they could really comfort each other because they really understood what each other was going through. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I forgot to bring the um, microphone, so I'm just going to kind of summarize in case it doesn't didn't pick it up on the recording. Um, Diana was saying... Um, that she thought just having someone around um, would help. And, and Nicole was saying um, being able to withdraw, but still being able to have someone around uh, who will listen that won't just bring it up when, you, when she's talking, but she can just kind of clear her head too. And then uh, Serena was talking about... Um, uh, brain fart. Uh, Reaching out to somebody that's maybe also suffered a lot. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, people, okay, yeah, people who can share the burden with you of, of what you've gone, have gone through. Yes, okay. Um, so anybody else? I think that's good to have someone like that. She's someone who knows what you, yeah, uh, who knows what you've went through. Like, um, my grandma and her sister, they both lost their husbands within like six months of each other. Wow. So, um, they could kind of, you know, be there for each other no. and knew what each other had kind of went through. And so, no. I think that's a good thing. Because a lot of times, um, people will say, you know, oh, I know what you're going through and stuff, you know, but... <laughs> do you, though? <laughs> you know? yeah. And then it just makes things worse. No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, anything else? I don't want to skip anybody. Zach? Gracie? Um, I think for me, like I think like the first week I, I would want to be kind of alone to process it. And then after that have someone, you know, come around and help me. Um just kinda of get out there again. Not necessarily talking about what's going on until like, you know, I bring mm -hmm. it up. But um, you know, just have fun thing, you know, like, go go through the day like it's normal, you know. But I think it'd be important to, um, like, if someone else lost someone, I think it'd be important to ask them, what do you, what can I do to help? Mm. You know, because I think a good it's point. really important to help, I mean, be there for someone, but also with each, you know, with each of our answers, each of them sway from thing to thing. So I think it would be good to uh, hear what they, they they would need most. Keep going. <laughs> no, keep going. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Um. So was that all you were going to say? Okay, all right. Uh, we are talking about um, dealing with loss. Um, so was there, what, did anybody else have anything to say before we move on? And I'm going to skip anybody here. Okay, all right. So uh, there, are, there are five stages of grief and loss um, as taught in um, basically psychology classes um, and counseling classes and whatnot. Um, but these, I, I really think uh, Gracie already kind of hinted towards this. Everybody grieves a little bit differently, and not everybody else, not everybody is going to go through all five stages. Not everybody is going to go through them in the same order. Um, not everybody is going to just be able to, um, you know, hop hop to it. You know, people are gonna. Um, some people deal, um, deal with pain slower, um, some people faster. It, it really just depends on the person. Not to say anything about the person's character themselves, just that people are different. Um, 
So different people experience variations. Um, what's important though is that we let it pass naturally and normally. We don't need to push somebody through the processes of grief. We just need to be there for them and let them handle it in the way that, that, that they want to. Okay. Obviously, you need to be careful because sometimes people think that they want something that they really don't and it just leads them into further depression. Um, so give them space and whatnot, but have a very, very cautious ear. If you overhear anything, if you see anything, just you know, be in there to swoop on in. Um, and so the, the first step is denial, isolation. is kind of that this isn't really happening or, you know, uh, that kind of... Um, shock that happens yeah shock that happens when you lose someone and you just kind of like what i just saw them the other day you know what i mean it's just like this uh what is it surreal is that the right word the surreal feeling um and then there's anger which is like a lot of times it, it can be pointed at different things it's your fault or that idiot if you would have just you know all of a sudden you, you're you're lashing out at the person who, who lost yeah. you know what I mean <laughs> or somebody tries to help you out you, you lash at them you know uh, just kind of like this this uh, this resentment you know this uh, irritation at, at the situation why am I in this situation it's not fair you know j just anger in general it can be really pointed at different things uh, the third step is bargaining um, and this happens in a, in a lot of different um, different <coughs> ways one is an, on a religious basis you know um, in fact, let me pull up this link here. Um, I think they gave a really good example of um, of the bargaining process um, as soon as it pulls up. Well, while it's pulling up, for religious people, it's it's more like um, you know where where you where you try to like pray your way out of it like um, God it, it take me instead or or um, you know if you if you bring them back I'll, I'll do anything or you know that kind of thing um, and it can really be pointed at different areas there I'll, I'm I'm kind of waiting to elaborate on that until this page pulls up um, and then there's uh, the depression this is where um, you kind of get more and more focused on the event that actually happened and it just causes you to not really want to continue with the process, um, especially if someone's, um, if someone you, you were close to, and, um, why is this not opening up? Hey, Ben, you hold down shift and click it, right? Control. Control? Where did it go? Where's my little pointer? Let me try to do it from out of the PowerPoint, maybe. What? I'm just going to copy it and search it. <laughs> if you can't do it the uh, easy way, you do it the harder way. <laughs> I guess I'm the kind of guy. And with depression, um, like all the stages, it can really come and go in any um, in any amount of time. Um, a lot of times, even when someone's out of the depression stage, technically. You know, they may still experience, you know, days, bad days, bad, um, just bad times. If the, if the weather is a certain way, you know, maybe reminds them of something. Um, maybe an activity that they used to do with the person, like I was talking about, um, that would just cause someone to um, to kind of uh, get nostalgic. Um, really, it's one of those things where if you've gone through it, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you really don't know until you've <laughs> gone through it. Um, it. But the depression can oftentimes be a, a kind of heaviness. And that's kind of important to understand because, like we were talking about with depression um, a couple weeks ago, um, you need to make sure that the person is not uh, suicidal and that um, they have the, the necessary help to prevent them from, you know, doing anything uh, 
drastic in a, in a time of an emotional hurt, um, especially if the person already has different things like um, general anxiety disorder or depression or something like that. Um, it, it can kind of be that, that too big of a blow that pushes them over. Um, and like I say, sometimes um, they, they'll go straight to the depression. You can't really know for sure how someone's going to um, respond. It's there, it just won't load. <laughs> just load the page! <laughs> Golly! And I purposely put the link there so this would be a real quick transition, and my computer's just like, nah, nah. I've had enough of this, man. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, let's just go back to this, and I'll go back to that in a minute. Okay. And then the last stage is acceptance. Um... Which isn't as peaceful as it as it sounds. It's just kind of like this um, realization of what's going on, and just kind of a, a, a I don't want to say peace or calmness about it, um, as those things you really have to seek after and try for. Um, but kind of like just up here, you know what's happened, and you realize that there's nothing you can do about it. You know what I mean? So um, I'll go ahead and move on, and we'll go back to that at the end of the lesson. Um, just don't let me forget, because they really gave some good examples of, of bargaining. Um, and one thing that, that this article specifically said is, is um, you know, uh, obviously after there's a certain time after after this. It's not a specific time. It's just a certain time, you know, after this time has passed, where you kind of reach this place of um, it's like a veil lifts, and you're just a lot more calm about it than you were before. And this can take years, um, and it's just something that happens when you realize, hey, you know, the world is still spinning and there's still life to live. And it's not like a coldness hits you, but it's like a zeal to live hits you. I don't know if I can, if I'm direct, if I'm correctly explaining that, but um, and so that's the what what, the, what was in this article that was an example of that is as long as there is hope, there is life, and as long as there is life, there is hope. It's just kind of this, you know. Realization that life does go on is as painful as it can be. So, um, we're going to deal with kind of three different domains of of uh, of dealing with it um, for you, for others, and um, I forget what the other one was. Ah, I write I write myself notes, but then I don't write myself summarizations of the notes. So, for you, first off, give it time. First off, give it time. Definitely give it time. Uh, don't try to rush yourself. Um, a lot of times we can kind of try to feel like, you know, if I just, I, I'm supposed to handle this differently or I'm supposed to be stronger or I'm supposed to be, um, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be an example. I, I, you see this one a lot. I'm supposed to be the example. If I can't deal with this, how am I going to, you know, and really it's not, it's important that you don't push yourself in, in that uh, uh, manner real quick. Just let yourself grieve naturally. And don't try to force yourself through it too quickly or else it'll just make it worse. Um, so definitely give it time. Uh, saying enough, think about something else, especially for the first couple weeks. You're, you're not going to want to um, just sit there and think about how much you miss the person. <laughs> I mean, this is going to push you over the, over, the over the bridge into depression. This is something that you can't let yourself do. Think about something else. I mean, if, if it's just sitting on your front porch staring at grass or staring at ants, do that, <laughs> but don't just sit there and, and you know, because um, you're going to destroy yourself slowly piece by piece, and it's something that's very hard to pick yourself back up about, um, and it's just a whole lot easier if you deal with it as you can. Don't push yourself into it too much. Just deal with it as you can. Allow yourself to mourn. You, you see this happen a lot, especially with religious people, as they get this feeling that they that they somehow it's wrong for them to grieve, or somehow you know they should be quicker to grieve through the process because they're saved or because they have Jesus or whatever. And that's just a load of horse crap. I mean, it, it's the grieving process. It comes when it does, and it goes as it does. I mean, you can't push yourself um, out of it. You can't will yourself out of it. Is what I'm saying. Um, Consciously notice the positive and be thankful and get out of the house. So let's take that apart. Consciously notice the positive. Serena talked about this. The time that you got with the person. Um, the positive things that are happening in your life. Hey, I still have a job. Hey, I, I still have friends. Or hey, I, whatever. I mean, even if it's just a dog. Notice anything positive in your life. You know, just some, something to, to divert your attention onto. Um, be thankful. 
for even the smallest of things, if somebody brings you a meal, just realize the time and effort that they put into it and just be thankful for the little things like that. You know what I mean? Um, to just just try to – obviously, don't guilt yourself about things, but be, be thankful about, about it. Just stay positive um, and get out. You, you don't want to stay holed up in your house. Um, just the, the light alone can, can, can make your attitude worse. Go out, see the sun, uh, see the sights. Go out and do something that you enjoy doing. Um, try to, you know, um, get exercise. Exercise is a great way to help help to help our bodies process uh, emotions. Um, and if you get lost, if, 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 you know, you feel like you just can't pull through this thing, counselors can help. There is no weakness. A lot of times Christians have this idea that there's weakness. If you go to counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, etc., it's not. There's not. Um, you know, if you need the hand up, get the hand up. Do whatever it takes to get through it. Um... And then lastly, seek God, and some heaviness will not pass without seeking God. Uh, there are some times when you will continue to, to feel the hurt until you find something else to rest in, and that something else can be God. So, But I do want to kind of, um, and I'll talk about this later um, in a, here in a little bit, that person dying is never going to be, is never going to be undone. Okay, There is going to be hurt that stays with you for forever, and there's going to be like a hole. Okay? And you can try if you want, but nothing's going to fill that hole. What happens is you just kind of learn how to live with it, and you learn how to work around it. Does that make sense? But in that, don't forget that there's a lot of other places that are still filled with other people and, and with other memories. Um, and I'm trying to say this that gives balance to the, to the two sides of not going to either extreme. Um, but yes, definitely seek God during those times, as he definitely has a way of bringing peace and uh, comfort in those times. Um, so just some notes I have written here on the side. Exercise. Definitely exercise. You, you want to get your body moving. Get you know, um, it, It's actually proven that um, exercise helps you feel better about yourself and about the situation. Um, eat healthy. A lot of times we want to eat comfort food, which is fine for small doses, but if you eat too much healthy food, I'm mean, sorry, um, comfort food, it's just going to make you feel worse. Um, obviously, it's things like McDonald's and stuff is basically putting like crap inside of your body. It's like, it's like eating crap. <laughs> so, um, um, have fun. Do something that you enjoy doing. Now, you don't want to be one of those people who just kind of sits on their couch all day watching TV or like uh, Isaiah was talking about the, the guy that's like 50 years old still playing video games in his parents' you know, basement. You don't want to be that person. But still, find something fun to do that, you know, just en enjoy life. Um, take up a new hobby. Um, if there's another language you want to learn, now's the best time to do it. <laughs> you know, if there's a new video game you want to get, now's the best time to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, go with friends. Don't be alone for long periods of time. We've kind of talked about all this stuff. Uh, but don't use things to hide. You need to deal with your feelings. Okay, You need to deal with the emotions that you are emoting. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is something where, yes, you should take it in strides as you can. You shouldn't try to push yourself through it, like power through. But at the, then other people go to another extreme where they just use the things to hide behind. You know, Video games, for instance, just become a crutch. Um, you know, th this other thing just becomes a crutch, and they never deal with those things, and so they carry around this hurt for year after year after year, and it never goes away because they never dealt with it. See, so, I mean, that's definitely not a healthy process. Um, don't don't try and guilt trip yourself through it, but don't go to the other extreme. Um, you'll know when you're procrastinating and when you're taking your time. You'll know the difference. You know what I mean? When it starts to feel a little bit more comfortable, just kind of ignoring it, hoping that it'll go away, you know that you're procrastinating. But you know when you're when you're dealing with it, and you're you, you know you know the difference. It's something that that um, sometimes takes time to realize, but eventually you'll kind of realize how it is. So uh, what about if, if it's for a friend? Um, before I go any further, any questions? Like I say, I didn't want this lesson to go real long because of just the emotional emphasis of it. I don't want to like overburden you overburden you guys. Uh, but if there are any questions, okay. Um, so if it's a friend going through it, not you, first off, listen and be available. Words are not necessary. Okay, A lot of times we think that we have to have all the right answers in order to be helpful to someone. That's just not true. Um, you kind of have to just take your cues from the other person. Okay, Like uh, Nicole and Gracie both, both brought up, different people handle it differently. And you just kind of need to be open to what they are saying, what they are, what they are wanting, 
Um, are they wanting you to, to talk about the person, or are they wanting you to just listen? It's really something that you're going to have to just kind of pay attention. This is going to be a lot easier if you know the person already and you're friends with the person already. Obviously, if it's just some random stranger and they're telling you all this stuff about this this person that passed away, you're going to be like, okay, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's easier if you're actually friends with the person who's who's lost someone. Um, so words are not necessary, but acknowledge. A lot of times we think that there's we can not acknowledge it, you know, like n not acknowledge their, their feelings and they'll get over it. But acknowledge them if they're trying to display something to you. If they're trying to get something off your chest, acknowledge what they're saying. You know, look at look at them. You know, accept what they're saying. Nod. You know, show that you're actually part of the conversation. Because a lot of times we kind kind of go into shutdown mode where we just kind of uh -huh. this conversation's awkward. Oh God, when will it stop? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's important that you make what start wondering. <laughs> uh, it's important that you that you make it known that you're there for that person and, and that if they want to talk about it, you want to, you're you're gonna listen. You're gonna talk about them. But if they don't want to talk about it, that's fine too. You know, I mean, just acknowledge that that, that um, what, what's going on. So, uh, don't try to have all the answers. One of the worst things we can try we can do is is come riding in on a white horse and we're gonna save their day. We're gonna save their world. Just let them process the emotions, you know what I mean? We don't have to have all the answers. Once again, this is especially difficult for Christians because they really feel like, you know, we read the Bible. That means that we should have, you know, 20 different verses that we're going to just say one of them and it's going to instantly heal and fix it. It's going to fix it. We are the fixers. And it just doesn't work like that. People need to process their emotions. And uh, so don't try to have all the answers. Um but obviously, as Serena mentioned, if there's something that the Lord lays on your heart, then by all means, do that. Do that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not um, ridiculing that. You know, that that's a good thing that Serena was talking about. Okay. But what I'm talking about is where we just kind of make stuff up because we have to have something to say because we just have to have an answer, and then we try to cram it down their throats and we try to force them into feeling better. You know, We're, this conversation isn't over until you're smiling, and then I can rest assured knowing that this is resolved, and I can go home now. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like that. People need to process their emotions once again. Um, pray for them. I know this sounds like a cop-out, but honestly, w before you go to sleep, if you wake up during the night, just take the time to pray for them. Um, it's very difficult to lose someone, especially when you're really close to them. And um, it's just easier when, when, when there's people praying. So, whoops. Uh, be sensitive and led by the Holy Spirit. Um, I think Serena already kind of touched on this. I don't really feel the need to elaborate too much on this. Encourage and don't let them shut down. Don't let them shut down. Um, do everything you can to let them know. Let, oh, Serena already talked about this so much. I don't really feel like there's anything more I need to add to this. Uh, you know, just let them know that you're there. Um, don't give Christian answers, what, what, what we call Christianese, uh, or use the Bible as an excuse to mistreat them. Well, the Bible says rejoice always. I don't see you rejoicing. It's like, well, geez, calm uh, down. I don't think that's what Paul was talking about, but whatever. <laughs> Mary hearts good like medicine. Do what? Mary hearts good like medicine. <laughs> Mary hearts good like medicine. <laughs> Once again, though, it, it's, 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 it's a normal thing to grieve when somebody <laughs> dies. It's a completely normal thing. You don't need to guilt trip yourself, and you don't need to guilt trip your friends. So, um, what not to do. Any questions on that before I... Progress forward. Go back? Okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to rush it. You know, going on the talking about not speaking Christianese or whatever to somebody. I had somebody who experienced a loss. And they were constantly talking about, they're still with me. I saw this person in my Cheerios the other day, you know, like, like Whoa, you know, that, like that got dark <laughs> really fast. Like that. You didn't eat them, did you? Did you really <laughs> say that? But, you know, you get the idea of what I'm saying. Like, the wind blew the other day and knocked the phone out of my hand and something <laughs> magical happened, and I know it was them. Uh, you know, like they were Whoa, they're haunting you. <laughs> get out of that house. <laughs> The dog looked up the other day and just started barking. I know it was them, you know? And it took everything in my power to not be like, no, they are not still with you. <laughs> but you know what? God told me not to do that because they were still in that 
they were still processing. Uh -huh. As someone mentioned, I think it was crazy. They were still processing what had happened. And it just was not the time to start pointing out. No. You're wrong. No. You're wrong. You're wrong. You know? And, and as time You're so wrong! On, <laughs> as time went on, I was able to kind of, you know, say things gently to try and curb them. But honestly, I, I still ended up upsetting the person in the end by telling them, no, you know that's not true, right? Because they're in heaven. You, you don't want that. You don't want to feel like they're still here. Like, that's no fun. That like, would suck. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, no, they're with Jesus. That's a better place. They're not here, you know? And it still upset them a little bit. But, you know, I think we have to know when the right time to say something is even if we know it's not right and 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 you know it as in our minds we know that's not biblical blah 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 you know we're going through that and we're, we're just thinking we need to correct them they're so wrong <laughs> you know but you no idea how wrong you are <laughs> don't <laughs> we don't i mean there's a there's a right time and, and i think that also kind of goes with being led by the holy spirit but, you know because <laughs> God told me, don't say that to her now. It's, it's funny because my biggest problem is not knowing the truth. It's delivering it at the right time. Mm -hmm. There was this one time, there was this one time that the that, that pastor was talking about um, this different thing with, with fathers. And th this woman stood up at the end of the service and just said something completely not true. And I was like, what? That's the dumbest thing I've heard. Luckily, she didn't hear. But Pastor looked around. <clears throat> it was just funny. Like, I don't have that that yeah. Control. thing over my mouth that Serena evidently does have. Because I'm just like, that's stupid. Why would you believe that? You know why I have that thing over my mouth now is because I continue to say things to correct this person many times that they told somebody else i'm not talking to serena anymore because all she does is do 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 do, do say this, this and that and it's always about god this and you're not got you're not you're not following god and that's why this is happening to you I'm like i never said that to this person but they feel like i'm always condemning them because i constantly am correcting them like no that's wrong and so that's why I've kind of learned to listen to God when he says, don't say that, because I've said that way too many times, and now this person does not want to talk to me about anything like that. And that's bad. Who enjoyed that story? <laughs> yeah? Okay, yeah. Can tell us more. No. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> stupid anyways, right? <laughs> no. They, they, remember, we talked about that last week. Oh. People are not stupid. I wasn't here, so I have an excuse for not knowing what she's talking about. All I heard last week was people are stupid. <laughs> people are stupid. Don't listen to them. Okay. Okay. Man, I, I just kind of want you to retell that story all over again. Yeah, I'm glad the microphone isn't here. <laughs> what she said. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, what not to do. Rush it or be impatient. Um, like Serena just kind of talked about, don't be impatient with the person. Um, realize that they are um, that they are dealing with it, and this is honestly my hardest thing because it's like, okay, look, if you don't if you don't know the truth, how are you going to possibly get over this? Because you're going to constantly tell yourself these lies, like that they're talking, I guess, talking to your dog or <laughs> disrupting your dog, they're whatever it is. Their presence is there. You know what I mean? Like if you're believing these stupid things, like it's going to prevent you from moving on and growing from this, right? Like that's in my, that's my thinking process, right. but people don't really work like that. They don't work like Michael thinks. <laughs> See what I mean? You understand what I'm saying? So don't be impatient with them. Don't be impatient with them, um, and don't rush it if it's you. I already kind of mentioned this. This is the quickest way to make it last longer than it should by trying to rush it and trying to be strong enough. It's just not gonna happen. Um, don't use drugs and alcohol, medication, and correct dosage is not included. Okay, for instance. If you are on depression medication and you are taking your correct dosage, I am not talking about that. If you are getting drunk to get over your feelings of depression, that is what I'm talking about. Because what's going to happen is you're going to make yourself way, way, way more depressed. And it's the same thing for alcohol. You'll feel good for like, you know, just that little bit of time, but then afterwards the kickback's going to be terrible. Um, it's like 
Um, Gracie was describing this this uh, kind of cheaper shotgun that she had, where when she would shoot it, it would really kick back real hard. That's kind of like trying to trying to get over losing someone by taking drugs or alcohol. It gives you a heck of a kickback, and you're gonna miss the target anyways because it kicks back so bad. So, anyways, um, hold a high expectation of what should be for yourself or others. Don't ever do that. You know, oh, I'm a Christian, so I shouldn't be dealing with this. Or hey. Your whatever, so you shouldn't be dealing with this. Chuck, you're you're the you're the youth leader. You, what the heck's wrong with you? You should be over this by now. You know what I mean? Like expecting others or yourself to be just at this high expectation that's n not even human. You know what I mean? Where it's like superhuman. Like you would have to literally not have a brain or be like some kind of a robot in order to to not be processing this information. Now I do kind of want to stop here for a second and say something real quick. Women and men are going to process information differently. A lot of times men try to hide it, whereas women will be a little bit more um, obvious. Well, I don't say obvious. That's That kind of sounds Expressive. wrong. Expressive. Yeah. Not always, though. But as a general guideline, that typically is true. It, once again, differs from person to person. Okay? If you're one of those guys that gives big bear sobs, I'm not making fun of you. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen Dodgeball? Where the, where the uh, Girl Scout is taking the steroids, she's like, <laughs> sorry, I'm off topic. Anyways, um, so don't ho hold a high expectation of what should be to yourself or others. Um, don't guilt trip either yourself or others. Once again, these all kind of go hand in hand, but I wanted to say it in four different ways so you kind of really get what I'm talking about here. Don't guilt trip people, um, and definitely don't guilt trip yourselves. Um, sometimes you just, I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of times Chuck I mean, will probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, pastor, for instance, tells us, tells us about how sometimes, you know, all the world is bleak, but then I'll just go to sleep and the next morning he'll wake up and it's fine. Well, we know what that's like, you know, you know what I mean? I don't know if, if that works out for you guys, but it works out for us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just take a nap and you feel better. It's kind of that, that same thing where, where it's, it's just a process. So. Um, really, the the thing that should be written on your sheet by this point about 17 different times is that it's a process. <laughs> I've said it about 20 different times for a reason. So, um, don't lean on things to give comfort. Lean on people to give comfort. Lean on God to give comfort. If you lean on things, it will develop into an addiction. If you lean on people, it will develop into stronger friendships and it will develop into... Um, a stronger character, it'll develop into. See what I mean? It, it develops there. But if you if you lean on things, nothing can happen from that. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna hold you back from from maturing in another way. I, I don't want to say maturing in a negative sense though, like you weren't before, because when you lose someone, it's not that you need to mature to get over them. That's not what I'm saying. I mean growth, in the process of growth. Losing someone is difficult, and and and. You go through a process of growing in a way that's very painful in order to get over them. Does that kind of make sense? So. Well, another thing I think that needs to be into consideration too is um, who you've lost. You're going to deal with that in a different way. Yeah. Like uh, a parent that loses a child mm -hmm. is going to deal with it a lot more. Uh, yeah. Strongly per se than a child that loses a parent. Right. You know, as an adult. Yeah, especially yes. I was gonna say something like that, and I thought maybe I shouldn't. But since you brought it up, anyways, that yes. Uh -huh. It is natural to lose your parents. It's not so much natural for a parent to have to bury their child. Right. You know I mean, it's something that no parent goes into seat holding their baby and thinking, yes, I'm going to have to bury this. <laughs> See what I mean? It's something no parent thinks about while they're going through the process of labor and pregnancy. It's not something that enters your mind. You have hopes and dreams, uh -huh. and and so that's that's a very that's a very good point. Different 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 circumstances are going to be a lot different. I mean, those of us who have kids, if you lost Colt, oh, yeah. versus if you lost your dad, it would be sad to lose your dad, but but Colt is your Actually, son. In fact, uh, speaking on that, uh, I know that my dad is. Very, very, my real dad is very, very sick. He's in. Last time I heard, he's on a hospice. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, well, I. I'm not very close to my dad. Ah. On an aspect, and 
I just never been one to, you know, really try to, you know, yeah. And, uh, I know it's coming, but I'm anticipating a lot and trying to keep my distance. Ah. Because I, I, sometimes I don't know how to deal with Especially when it's yeah, yeah. so close that uh, I don't know what might happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I know what you're talking about. Well, I'm sorry I didn't mean to bring that oh, up. No, no, I, no, I had no, no idea but, who's but, on this Well, I was kind of. It just. All this. this uh, I got gotcha. you. Brought it up, yeah. Yeah, exactly what I didn't want to do. Sorry. <laughs> I know, well, it, but it was just ha it, last month. It's been, or last couple of months, uh, it's been kind of where my dad was sick in the hospital, and all it was was an ulcer, and he got the you know took had the procedure, and went home, and and then all the next thing is uh, my mom texts me, hey, you need to. Call, don't call my stepmom, call my aunt. I don't have my aunt's number. And so they, and usually when I get a phone call, I don't, if it's not my contacts, mm -hmm. I don't answer unless I hear a voicemail. Right. So, I mean, I still haven't, you know, heard anything else. But Waiting I really, inevitable. I do, but then I, I don't want to on that aspect of, yeah. Yeah. And for Colt, he hasn't seen him since he was ever. Oh, okay. Just through Facebook and whatnot. Uh, Becky is friends with my stepmom through on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, he does things on video or whatever. But I know it's it's close. Mm -hmm. He's he's got Huntington disease. Okay. Yeah. Um, luckily, my brother and I don't have it, but we may be a carrier. Um, I know that uh, each generation, it gets worse and worse. Oh, yeah? I didn't um, know that. Yeah. Actually, by the fourth generation, you wouldn't even be... If I had it, I would be long gone past ten. Wow. Yeah. I didn't I know mean, that. Well, I didn't know either until... Uh, when my dad got diagnosed back in 07, uh, my mom, he Excuse told me. my Sorry. mom and my stepdad, uh, during, uh, when my brother was getting married, uh, during that time, and, uh, after we got back, uh, went to, since I got my, got, uh, medical benefits with SSI, uh, I went to Dr. Simmons, mm -hmm. and he said that there's nothing like that from me. I have developed any symptoms. Um, it starts out with your psychological mind, and then it goes down to uh, nerves, yeah, like twitching and uncontrollably um, due to uh, being upset or being angry or whatever. Uh, my grandfather, every time I knew when he's upset, because he, then he stops mm. um, shaking or moving, twitching. And it, it almost seems like it's a yeah, cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. but it's kind of similar, but it's not. Mm. Um, and then uh, eventually, my, like my grandfather, he uh, passed away with a heart attack. But it was due to. Oh, so it's already been in your family for for a while. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's something that you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have it, so to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, I might be a carrier, which means Colt might be right. a you know, carrier. And so, right. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
but yeah, definitely different different people are gonna are gonna be able to, to deal with it at different places, especially at what point you are in life and different things like that. Really a great point, Chuck. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, so, so just some considerations here. Um, I already mentioned this. There will always be a hole. Sometimes we try to fill the hole, but that's just an unrealistic expectation. Um, it's better if you can once again come to the idea of accepting it. Remember those five stages of grief. If you can get to a place of, of realizing that um, that's that that they're gone. You know what I mean? And 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 um, when you stop trying to fill with other people with other things, you start realizing that it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. It's something that sticks with you, and it's something that you that you learn from, and it's something that's, that's always with you. Um, but it doesn't have to be something that um, tears you down. It doesn't have to be something that forever holds you back from from you know other things in life or from other genuine relationships. But it's definitely something that can, um, in many ways, profit you. I know that sounds kind of silly with with us talking about losing someone, but it is definitely something that that, that once we accept it, you know, and the pain the pain eases, you know, it, it's something that 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 does move us forward. Um, so, um, time will give clarity, but not healing. Oftentimes, you hear people say, uh, "Time heals all wounds." That's just not true. Um, what What happens is, what, if you just give it some time, you'll get clarity. Um, you'll be you'll have a little bit of distance from it, so you'll be able to process the information better. Um, but the wound will still be there, and you are still going to have to deal with that wound. See what I mean? Um, so, um, deal with what you can, when you can. I already mentioned this a couple different times. You don't want to, once again, you don't want to push yourself, but you want to make sure that um, you are dealing with it instead of avoiding it. Um, you must choose to let go and move on. It is a process that has to take place. Um, the only other alternative is to keep bearing it and to keep reminding yourself of it and to keep tearing yourself up about it. And you have to choose, you know, I've got to let this go. I have to let it go. And that's a difficult thing to do, but once again, don't try and do it as soon as a person dies. Don't try to do it too soon. Once again, <laughs> don't push yourself too hard. But there's going to be a time when you, when, when you know that you're ready and you just have to kind of let go. And this is obviously a process. It's not like you're going to, I let go, and all of a sudden, boing, and light shines down from above. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be you wake up and you realize they're gone. That's just how it is, and I'm going to move on. And it's going to be a process. It's going to be painful, but it's going to be a process. Um, friends can help with this, obviously. Um, but once again, take friends for who they are. Don't try and find a new friend that's exactly like that person who died away to fill in the gap. It, you see people do this. They marry someone, then they have marital problems, so they get divorced, and they marry another person that that's a poor, has poor character, and they do the same thing over and over again. I'm not saying every time that there's a divorce that happens. I'm saying oftentimes you see it with divorce. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, so suicide doesn't mean they weren't saved. I know people have heard this countless times. If somebody kills themselves, do they automatically go to hell? There's nothing in the Bible that says that. There's absolutely nothing in the Bible that says that. Suicide does not mean hell. Okay? It does not mean that they were not saved, and it doesn't mean that they lost their salvation. God, Christ is able to carry us past the realm of uncertainty and ambiguity. Okay? He is able to do things that we don't quite understand, and that's okay. We don't understand what happens to a baby before they accept Jesus as their Savior, and that's okay, because we're not the master of souls Jesus is. See, that's okay. You just have to come to that realization that God's realm is God's realm and your realm is your realm. So as far as I know a lot of time, especially throughout church history, it's been emphasized, especially over the past 150 years, that suicide is loss of salvation. That's just not true. It's not backed up by the Bible. The Bible just simply doesn't offer any information on that. For all, for, for all of that matters, um, the Bible doesn't say killing is wrong. It says murder is wrong. And so suicide doesn't equate necessarily to murder. I have a and just and and furthermore, even if it did, um, sinning doesn't make you lose salvation. It puts up barriers between you and God. And if you continue to put up those barriers, you come to a place of giving up your salvation. I've talked about this multiple times. So once again, do we know with certainty? No, we do not. But the idea that, yes, suicide does not mean that, that they weren't saved is false, okay? 
the truth is that we don't have complete certainty on that. So don't guilt trip yourself, just like God be God, and you move on and let it go. Uh, Serena? Well, I, and I just want to know, like, your opinion on this. Um, I had read, you know, concerning suicide and, you know, whether that's an automatic, like, you go to hell type thing, is that the Ten Commandments all relate to doing something to someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and including murder mm-hmm. is doing something to someone else, not to yourself. Mm-hmm. So I would agree with that. That's kind of like how they had explained that suicide does not mean automatically that you go to hell. Because, yeah, they say in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, but that's all the Ten Commandments are your actions towards someone else, not necessarily yourself. Well, I think that's a good basis right. to start from for, for my point. But with that being said, a counter arguer. I do not take this view, but I'm saying it could be argued against this, mm-hmm. that um, you know the Bible's implication of how to treat other people also applies and trickles down to how we treat ourselves. For instance, when we love our, our enemies as we love ourselves, that by by definition means that we should love ourselves. See what I mean? So technically you could argue against that, but I don't really take that point of view. But I'm just saying it's out there, yeah. but that's a good basis for this, what I'm talking about either way. Good. And I guess my main point is um, that I do not think that people who commit suicide go to hell. But objectively, apart from my own opinion, the Bible does not give clear confirmation one way or another. The Bible gives confirmation with what you can do for salvation. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't really tell you how to solve everybody else's spiritual problems. It tells you how to minister to people. It tells you how to be used by God and by the Holy Spirit. And it tells you how to seek after God for yourself. But God did not position us to mother people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Diana, those shoes clash. You know what I mean? That, that's not that's not what God told us to do spiritually. Right. You know what I mean? So with that being said, I, I, I don't really want to um, make your decision up for you. Okay? But I, I would definitely agree with what Serena is saying. Myself, my own personal opinion. Um, so praying for the dead does nothing, though. I, I know in, in a moment of pain, it can seem like this is the thing to do. Um, however, the Bible is very, very clear that once the, once the death process is in place, that's it. Uh, it is appointed to man once to die, and then what, Serena? That's it. Then the yeah, judgment. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> why, why I said Serena is because we had some conversations about um, reincarnation. Oh, Anyways, oh. Um, I don't want to get off topic or anything, but uh, <laughs> even if you look at Mormonism, right? Or was it? Yeah, Mormonism, right? They're the ones who do the prayer for the dead, right? They baptize for, baptize the, for the dead, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mormons. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they do that based off of one ambiguous passage where Paul's talking about some things that other people in the city were practicing. But the Bible itself does not tell us to do such a thing. Well, um, I, I know another thing sort of similar to that was, um, I don't know if they still practice that around here or not, but uh, when my mom's brother died, um, the Catholics were wanting to break him out of purgatory. Yeah, the last right thing, yeah. Well, that's actually a good point, too. Um, you know, since Catholicism is so strong in the area, I guess we could go ahead and, t- and talk about that, too. Basically, um, there's this idea of purgatory, which is not really heaven, it's not really hell, it's kind of in between. I don't really want to go too much into it, but basically... Like yeah, like a waiting place. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that, you know, after so much time or whatever, you're going to eventually go to one or the other. And so with last rites, especially in the more older traditions, they would have these little coins and stuff that they would give. Once again, don't really want to give, go too much off off here, but the idea of last rite is that you, you, you pray their soul out of purgatory. Um, but with that being said, um, the Bible has no indication that there is a purgatory. It only ever talks about an absolute heaven and hell. It never talks about an in-between state. It always talks about when death you immediately go to that. Um, the only exceptions to this are in the Old Testament where it talks about death in the sentence in the sense of where everybody goes, death, mm-hmm. but not really so much a place. This is called Sheol. And uh, Jehovah's Witness, for instance, have made a huge doctrine about this, which just really doesn't have a whole lot of biblical basis. Obviously, you can, like I've said this a hundred times, you can make the Bible say anything. You can make the Bible support, um, you know, having multiple wives, doing drugs. I mean, you can make it support anything you want. That doesn't mean that it actually says that. See what I mean? So, 
uh, with that being said, um, I, there's really no basis for the idea of a purgatory. So if there is a purgatory, God did not tell us about it, and if we have to also realize that that would mean that he also didn't give us a way to get out of that purgatory because he didn't tell us about it. <laughs> See what I mean? It's kind of one of those things where evidently he didn't want us to know about it if it actually does exist. So as far as we know, it doesn't exist. Right. That right. kind of makes sense? Right. So. Well, um, you can look to what it is tell the thief on the cross is that today you today. will with him in yeah. paradise. Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't say, now just hang on there. <laughs> yeah, hang on. I'll come get you I'll someday. I'll come back for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's actually a really good point. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, um, oftentimes in the grieving process, we're going to look at just a few passages, but oftentimes in the grieving process, some people come to the conclusion of, I can't do this. That's an okay place to reach, okay. You just need to not stop there. You need to get help from there. But with that being said, live this day. See, oftentimes when we say, I can't do this, our focus is on what's going to happen in, in the coming weeks. How are we going to handle tomorrow? How are we going to take care of? Don't worry about it. Just get through today. Just live today and do the things you need to do today. Get your mind off of it today. See what I mean? And when you kind of live in that immediate context, it really helps with relieving a lot of pressure. Because you don't have to do all that stuff that you've been worrying about. Don't worry about it. That's tomorrow's problem. Today, it's okay. Do you know what I mean? Um, and obviously you don't need to uh, to give yourself false hope. Oh, everything's going to be okay. Well, sometimes everything isn't going to be okay. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about, you know, tomorrow may not ever even happen. Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> Some people have heart attacks quite suddenly. Do you know what I mean? You could literally die before it even becomes a problem. Would you really want to spend the last moments of your time worrying about it? Uh, See what I mean? And little Jesus talked about this when he said, you know, hey, let tomorrow's worries take care of itself. Uh, Today has enough worry about its own. You know what I mean? It's going to come either way. You can either approach it with joy in your heart or approach it with fear in your heart. But you can't have both. See what I mean? So, really, with that being said, um, live this day. Burden The burdens will pass, definitely. Burdens do have a way of, of passing. Anybody who's gone through a panic attack knows this. You go through the panic attack, and for that, it's like, ah, this is going to be like this forever. And then, like, you know, time passes, and eventually the panic attack goes, you know, where it mellows out. You know what I mean? It, 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 the feelings will pass. Um, so, Revelations 21 4. And I know I said Revelations, and everyone goes, ah. Everyone goes, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I should say in all the PKs, say, uh. <laughs> okay, so. It's the four horse moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> and submitted the. <laughs> anyway. uh, Revelations 21, uh, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. In heaven, there's this idea that not necessarily, I know a lot of people teach this, you will have no recollection of your life on earth. And I don't really see any clear indication of that from Scripture, but our priorities will change in heaven, our understanding of things will change in heaven, and once again, all those things will be eclipsed by the glory of God. And once again, we won't have these same bodies. We'll have glorified bodies, which won't be susceptible to the things that we are now susceptible to. See what I mean? It, it, it's a new era for us. So with that being said, we can know, though, that we won't, feel that same despair that we felt on earth. People who have suffered their whole life dealing with depression, for instance, will get to heaven and it won't be a problem for them anymore because they'll be given a glorified body. So, um, Psalm 34, 18. That's 745. Um, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the Christian spirit. And that's kind of what I was talking about when I said seek after the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, there is definitely a, a peace that comes when you seek after the Lord that doesn't come in any other way. You still go through the grieving process, but how does Paul put it? You don't mourn like those do without hope. You'll mourn for a time, but it won't be the end of the story. There will be a, an, another chapter after that where you, know, where you rise up again. Does that make sense? So, Whereas those who mourn without hope, there is no reason for another chapter to just kind of, there's a hole in my heart and that's it. 
there's a hole in our hearts, yes, we can still go through the pain, same pain, but we have someone who carries us through those times. So I mean that we depend on that. Although we still feel the same hurt, it's not like we're exempt from hurt. But we have our God who who, who stands with us in that time. So, um, Second Corinthians one. Guys, I am really crushing on this Bible. This this is an ESV Fire Bible, and I am crushing on a hardcore. I highly encourage you to get one. Oh my gosh, it's my love. And if you don't want a big one, they make them small. Yeah, Gracie has this one. Okay. Does it have the study stuff? Yeah. yeah. Uh, mine is the student edition, so I have all the. Uh, Here's this what? The student, the student edition. edition. Oh. If, if you'd stop dropping the bottles, we could hear you more. <laughs> so it has like the um the extra stuff like this. Yeah, like mine is hers is a student edition. Mine is the uh, just the study edition. Um, so if you like a college student or whatever, the the student edition is is for that. If you're just like thirties or whatever, this one's for you. I mean, unless you care and you want to get that one, you can get that one too. It's not like you're gonna. This one's obsolete for me now. <laughs> you, there will still be things in there. But anyways, Second Corinthians chapter one, verses four through six. Um. Who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So, um, and there's a lot really in that verse. Um, I highly encourage you to go and read that and read the read the whole chapter and if the if you can the whole book because there's just a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, First Thessalonians chapter four verses thirteen through seventeen. First Thessalonians chapter four verses thirteen through seventeen. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring uh, with him those who have fallen asleep. And then through verse 17. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So there is definitely nothing but the cry of, of um, hope as far as the Bible is concerned. So, um, now the question of the week is how do you overcome greed? We will start talking about the um, the three ethical dilemmas starting next week. And um, there'll be a lot of other stuff thrown in there as well. Um, should you become a member um, of a church? Um, prayer. Uh, prayer uh, I know a couple weeks ago I, I talked about um, the people you shouldn't pray for, and a couple months ago I talked about prayer in a different context. And we're just kind of going to put a few closing remarks on that, and we'll just kind of shove it in the cracks of a short lesson. So, any questions about anything we talked about? Serena's mad dog in my eyeball. Bargaining. <laughs> bargaining. Bargaining. Yes, bargaining. Oh my gosh, yes. Don't tell me you froze. <laughs> It didn't load all that time that I was talking, and it didn't even load? What? <laughs> what? This is insane. Why don't you just copy and paste it, you know? That's what I did. Email it to each and every Oh. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Send it to us from the direct email. Do it. I don't. That looks 800. I'm like, go in there, and I'm like, I have to delete all these? I don't care about them. Well, at least I got that select all button now. Yeah. Yeah, but what if there's an important email in there? In there. You have to go through all 800. No, I know. No, they'll email again if it's that important. They'll call you. I hope so. Or send me a notice in the mail. Like the real mail. <laughs> the, the snail mail? Yes, snail mail. The real mail, she says. I checked that. Well, actually, my.
Right? Like, as a kid, you're all like, am I going to get something That's super? That's my favorite thing to do. Is Who's? Who's? Kyle. Yeah. He's on it. Sunday mornings, I'm like, there's no mail. You don't come on Sunday. No! Yeah. 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 He's like, he's like Darth Vader on that, the newer Star Wars. No! <laughs> Stupid. Okay, I loaded up the page, guys. Oh my gosh! It's so comfy in here. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Have you guys seen the uh, the South Park about uh, Scientology? Scientology? Yeah, Scientology. Uh, so. Um, so they think that um, Stan Stan is the uh, reincarnation of um, L. Ron Hubbard, <laughs> the the guy who founded Scientology. And uh, Tom Cruise all goes up there to talk to him, and Stan's like, "I just don't really like your movies." And he's like. <gasps> And so he he goes into the closet and he's all hiding in the closet and then um um John Travolta John Travolta oh yeah but the other guy that's saying the song oh, about trapped R in Kelly. the closet oh yeah R Kelly both go up there to try and talk him out of the closet and he's all like no I'm not coming out you guys kept coming in here and so so uh, John Travolta all goes in and he's like oh my god it's so safe and comfy in here I feel so secure oh my god I'm never coming out oh my god. <laughs> it's just so Kelly like, just sings about being in the closet. With now me. I'm in the closet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. This really is terrible, you guys. It, it is now frozen. Okay, here we go. I'm going to have to <laughs> have to point the Okay, there we go. Haha. -ha. <laughs> if only we had sought medical attention sooner. Ooh, really. If only we got a second opinion from another doctor. If only we had tried to be a better person toward them. These are all parts of the bargaining stage, and I'm sure you've heard this before. And that, what destructive words, but, I mean, seriously, what a perfect example of the bargaining card. Where you're trying to bargain about something that's, that's already passed, and it's just like, there, there's that lack of understanding that, that it, it doesn't matter now. You know what I mean? Right. Well, it does matter. It's like, well, okay. But in a couple months, in a couple of years, however long it takes you to process this, it's not going to matter that much anymore. What's going to matter is that you did have that time with them. So... Now let me see if I can close this stupid thing down. Oh my gosh. Okay, anyways. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, any any questions about the lesson? You can have a you can have a comment. comment. <laughs> but say it loud enough where I don't have to repeat it. No. You don't have to repeat it. Just hold the laptop over there. No, don't do that either. <laughs> no, that you were talking about the, the bargaining and everything and like Tonight address like two things specifically that, that I've dealt with and that's if somebody, you know, was saved or went to heaven or whatever, um, like with my dad, he committed suicide. That was something I struggled with for a long time that, you know, your mom always told me, like, you don't know what went through his mind before he, before he took his own life. Like, you don't know where he was at and that does not necessarily mean that, that he, he went to help. We don't know that, you know? But that's just always something that I had heard that I believed, you know. And um, so I've researched, you know, that a little bit, like finding different, which is where I came up with what I had asked you. And then the next one was, you know, my first pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And then I started hearing things about not knowing for sure if babies go to heaven. So once again, I was dealing with that again. And... Um, and I did the bargaining thing with losing a baby was if I would have done something differently, like, you know, mm. I, I was blaming myself for yeah. you know, my lifestyle and things like that, and that it was my fault. Um, so that kind of like dealt with both of those, but you know, over time I just had to realize that, you know, obviously it was not God's will, you know, my dad or God didn't want my dad to take his life, you know, but God knew that that was going to happen obviously. And, and for whatever reason, you know, God took the baby that I had. And so I just have to trust God because there's nothing I can do about either one of those things. But, you know, now my, my kids talk to me about their brother or sister in heaven all the time. And actually, just last week, Kyle got mad at me over it. And that really, like, rehashed a... And I ended up getting him in trouble because he said... You know, Mom, the baby in your tummy died? And I said, yes. And, you know, we tell him the baby's in heaven. Well, what did you do, Mom? How could you let that happen? And he got mad. Whoa. He started yelling at me and then started crying about it. And I was just like, 
I don't know how to tell you. <laughs> right? That's a new one. <laughs> and but but Kyle um, goes through phases of dealing with death. Mm-hmm. He goes through phases of, Mom, you're going to die. Mom, I'm going to die. And, and it takes me a while to console him over Yes, death. thank you for reminding me of my immortality, child. <laughs> <laughs> but now, you know, he started this thing with the baby dying. And I'm just like, stop it, Kyle. Stop it. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I didn't do that to him. But I told him, to stop talking to Mommy that way. Nobody right? knows what happened to the baby. Nobody knows why the baby died. Mommy didn't do anything. It just happened no but you know he does not process that like i've had the time to process that but that still it like wrecks you you know like yeah. your child is sitting there what did you do mom you know what's crazy like about a baby killer i didn't know there actually was a baby this whole time i didn't know there was actually a baby i thought i thought you just made that up this whole time no i really had a that is crazy whoa Boy, I tell you what. I can explain. I was a very troubled person. I told them my mom was dead. Like, I said all kinds of stuff because I didn't want to. There is basis for this. I'm not a terrible person. I, 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 I agree. There is basis. But no, I, I did not make 